Hi, everyone. I'm Peter Farnsworth, co-founder of the Salo Series, a community and platform that brings together and celebrates purpose-driven leaders. One of our key areas of focus and activities is to convene folks for enriching in-person and digital programming. And today is one of those days. We're thrilled to have everyone joining us today and for a quite, quite a timely and important session themed around the fragile nature of our democracy. Just briefly as background on SALA, our three areas, key areas of focus include one, much like today, engagement around important societal and business issues of our time, whether it's the future and impact of healthcare, future of education and work, the crisis of the criminal justice reform system, mental health, climate, sustainability. We have several different pillars that inform our programming that we focus on for the digital and the in-person programming. Another key area of focus is to connect our members of SALA and facilitate new partnerships so that we can serve as a catalyst for them to do the great work that they do, but also to, to help one another, support one another and grow and drive greater impact um, uh, jointly. So the connective tissue of SALA is very important among the members and friends of the family. The third is we're a philanthropic benevolent community and support the nonprofits that are doing the work, doing the, the sort of feet on the ground, that are doing the work every day around the topics that I mentioned, be it healthcare, education, or criminal justice reform, et cetera. So those nonprofits are members of our community and we're thrilled to support them. To support the nonprofits. We're sometimes described as the anti-tribe tribe. tribe. Um, our focus is on bringing together a wide range of members from different backgrounds industry sectors and lived experiences and about folks that might not meet but for SALA. And that's something we we are very proud of, can do more with. Of course, there's always room to grow in that regard, but it's a differentiator for us. We would encourage everyone to just spend time, if, if you have it um, and, and you've enjoyed today's session, please go to SALA series. How we show up is, is two words, SALA series be that on LinkedIn or be it on Instagram, et cetera, and, and join the community. Um, you'll find out more about our programming, ways to, ways to participate in the future. So with all that said, it's my great joy, truly an honor to introduce Juju Chang, television journalist, extraordinaire, anchor of Nightline, long, long list of accolades. She's a friend, collaborator, wonderful supporter of Sala and of our mission. Um, she is about the power of yes. We come to her with ideas and she's just so supportive and we are just are, are thrilled to have her in our community. She's also a remarkable example of purpose-driven leadership to which we're committed. Juju, please take it away. Well, that was such a lovely intro, Peter. Thank you. Um, I also believe that Sala is about human connection and the power of that. You guys, you and Jimmy Craft have done such a great job. I believe that convening power is a superpower and you have wielded that masterfully. Um, so I'm going to introduce the panel today. You know the topic. It's the fragile nature of our democracy with four days to go. Um, I know I've uh, voted in it early. I know many uh, on on this Zoom must have as well, but we wanna talk about sort of the pillars of democracy, where they are under threat, and perhaps where we um, as private citizens and purpose-driven leaders might be able to uh, support and reinforce some of those pillars. So let me start by introducing our panel. We have a Princeton rich panel. <laughs> uh, so if you're from one of the other Ivy League schools, don't be jealous. And if you're from like me and from California and part of the former Pac-10, then, you know, we're represented, don't worry. Um, I just want to introduce Eddie Glaud. Um, you know him as a, a, a high profile, prominent member uh, of the African-American scholarship world. Um, he is been at Princeton and is a notable uh, author, speaker, thought leader, and um, all around great human. Uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter is the CEO of New America, uh, formerly emeritus, as she reminded me, at 
uh, Princeton at Woody Woo. Um, she and I served uh, at, uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations. She has been in government in the highest levels, um, working in foreign policy, um, and is, again, a thought leader, a scholar, um, in, in so many ways, a, a purpose-driven leader. Um, and Professor Julian Zelizer, uh, also at Princeton, um, teaches history and public affairs, international affairs, another prominent author and uh, and deep dive thinker. So thank you for joining us. Let me just kick it off. As I said, we're four days away. Um, this election is being framed as the most consequential, certainly in our lifetime. Uh, it's also framed as having democracy on the ballot. Let me just have you guys start with um, this question of, is, is there, how much truth is there to that framing? And or is it just hyperbolic? Is it pearl clutching uh, in the moment? So let me start with the way I introduced you. Eddie, you take it away. Uh, well, first of all, it's a delight to be in conversation with you. Peter does just amazing work. Uh, it's great to see my colleagues, especially Anne-Marie. I haven't seen her in a while. And Julian, of course, is just brilliant. So it's great to see everyone. Um, no, it's not hyperbolic at all. Um, I think we're clear about uh, the dangers uh, the dangers to um, uh, the process as as such. And what I mean by that is that we know that there's going to be an ongoing question around the legitimacy of the outcomes of the election. Uh, so there's been uh, planted deep-seated distrust in the electoral process, uh, which uh, has set the stage for uh, an ongoing question about whether or not the results will be legitimate. Uh, and that in and of itself uh, uh, suggests that we are in a place that uh, is, or is, is in some ways distinct and unique. Um, and we also know um, uh, the aims and ends of uh, particular actors who are seeking the highest office. Uh, Donald Trump is very clear about his, his, his uh, agenda. Um, and if that agenda is associated with, and I don't want to sound partisan here, this is just descriptive. If it's associated with Project 2025, it presents interesting challenges to the very foundations of, of democratic life in the country. So I don't think it's hyperbolic at all. We are in a, a generational election uh, that will suggest um, uh, the future of the country. Anne-Marie, go ahead. Well, uh, I very much agree with Eddie. And uh, let me also start just by saying how happy New America is to be able to partner with Sala and, and bring you this event. And we, we do other work together. Uh, and just to note that Julian was a New America National Fellow. <laughs> we, we take great pride in that. <laughs> Eddie, we'd welcome you to apply. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, wanna, I want to second what Eddie said, and but I want to pursue a slightly different angle here. I do believe democracy is on the ballot. I believe that um, we should take people at face value when when a presidential candidate says, I'm going to be a dictator for a day, when he says that he's going to go after his political enemies, when he says that he's going to weaponize the Justice Department. I think it's really our duty as citizens to take those things seriously. And if you look through history, Far too many societies did not take those things seriously and lost their democracy as a result. But that very perception has become a part of the polarization that, that is putting our country in such crisis. You know, no matter what happens on Tuesday, essentially half the country is going to be very unhappy or believe that, that the results are illegitimate. And so what you hear from uh, the re Republicans is that to say democracy is on the ballot is Trump derangement syndrome, that if that actually this is something that um, reflects just how uh, far Democrats are willing to go in terms of, of getting hysterical about Donald Trump. And so it is it is actually obscured what I think many of us and Julian will speak next as a historian see as as a, a, a really frightening pattern. And again, you know, if if really, oh, he says it and he's not going to do it. Well, 
that would be great if that were true, but I don't think, and I really speak here not as a Democrat or a Republican, but as an American and as a patriot, if if we take our, our country's laws and values seriously, you have to take those states, statements seriously uh, and respond, again, as a citizen, not, not just as a member of a party. I'd say... Uh... So, so I agree with with my panelists in the places that you really see how this is historic in particular ways. Uh, one is uh, where Eddie started on the process. We don't have uh, lots of elections where the democratic process itself is uh, under fire and uh, uncertain. And we have some, 1800, for example, 1876, uh, 2020. Uh, but this one, it's pretty stark. I mean, we're worried about uh, the legitimacy of the results in the eyes of uh, citizens. We're talking about elected officials potentially trying to overturn the results from local boards to state legislators. And we're also worried about violence. So you add all this up, this is not the democratic process we hope for and that we count on. And it's really uncertain, and that makes it historic. Uh, two, I do think there's a question about the Republican Party that's on the table. I mean, the party has veered in a much more radical direction for over a decade. In many ways, uh, Donald Trump as president entrenched this. And now it's total clarity on what kind of Republican Party is on the ticket. There should be no question the party has coalesced around the ideas he embodies. And so uh, there's uh, some people might say, I don't believe what he says, but I think it's fair to say we should believe uh, not only the kind of governing style, but the issues he's put on the table. And so this is potentially a vote uh, in favor of this GOP. And I think that's very important, uh, including on foreign policy. Third, terms of power. He's been very clear about a very expansive view of presidential power that would make Richard Nixon look meek, frankly. Uh, he must be shaking his head as he watches this. How is he uh, kind of pushed out of office? Uh, it's Project 2025. It's the invocation of using the military against opponents. I mean, this is not what we have had traditionally, and we should all remind ourselves of that. Uh, and so uh, that use of presidential power, we could be months away from that, depending on how the election works. And that makes it historic. And finally, there are issues that I think where the nation is fundamentally divided and this will provide clarity of where we're moving, including issues like reproductive rights and uh, international alliances and uh, what voters decide and are deciding as we speak, I think will play a big role in which direction are we moving. Add all four of these together, uh, this certainly is not, uh, it is historic and it's not hyperbole to say uh, we're facing a very big decision in the coming days. Um, I'm curious, you know, because you're sitting, both of you are sitting with giant book bookshelves behind you and you're all, all, um, you know, academics, when you look at historical antecedents, like precedents, what, what do you look at? I mean, anything from January 6th to historical, you know, events in the past, what, if anything, informs, do you think, what you're looking at this year? Well, for me, when it comes to the fragility of democracy. Yeah, no, for me, you know, sometimes, you know, we could talk about eight, you know, presidential election of 1800. This is Jefferson and Adams. But for me, it's 1860. Uh, and, you know, with the link with Lincoln and forces uh, declaring very clearly that if he's elected, that they would uh, secede. Um, uh, and they're doing so on behalf uh, in defense of slavery, uh, which is a part of the central contradiction of the nation. Uh, a contradiction that has been in so many ways uh, that has shadowed right our democratic principles from from the inception of the republic so so 1860 comes to mind um the 1870s uh for me as well because Ju julian mentioned uh, the specter of violence and when i think about the collapse of reconstruction and i use that verb advisedly because it wasn't a collapse it was deliberate in so many ways. But when I think about the violence unleashed uh, from 1872 in Colfax, Louisiana to 1873 and Vicksburg, those are just the front ends. I mean, we could talk about 1898 in Wilmington, but, but the amount of death that comes in the wake of it, 
and and how uh, the reunion, the reconciliation takes place between these parties that split and who had to bear the burden of it. So I'm thinking about you know the collapse of reconstruction and what and its aftermath and what it generated. So those are the historical moments uh, that come to mind for me at least uh, immediately. Well, the majority of swing state voters say they fear violence if uh, former President Trump wins, or loses rather. Um, Anne-Marie, I was asking about historical precedents that come to mind, um, but also for you, you mentioned this idea that half the country is going to be very upset um, on November 7th. And what, what, if anything, can be done, you know, looking at that in terms of uniting the country or uniting around democracy? Two very different questions, I know, and you are muted currently. I'm going to take the, the second one. Uh, I do agree that I think about Reconstruction. I'll just say say historically, I'm also truly looking to, to Europe. Um, the uh, fascist movements in Europe in the 30s, not just in Germany, in many different countries, again, um, many people just thought that their democracy would hold. And it didn't. Uh, and I think Americans who are not historically informed believe that we are somehow insulated from, uh, you know, a coup, uh, a dis uh, the destruction of these institutions that we have built painstakingly uh, over hundreds of years, uh, but that we, uh, it was largely a white we for a long time, as, as uh, Eddie says, there were lots of big cracks and that's what, what caused the civil war before. But I think many of us think that can't happen again. And yet it can only not happen again if we take the threat seriously and work really hard uh, to shore it up, which then goes to your, your point about, well, what do we do if 50% of the country thinks that the result is illegitimate if not worse? And I do believe that whoever wins uh, although how we do this will depend on, on whoever wins, but who, whoever wins, there has to be really intensive work at the local level, at the state level, but really starting in communities across the country to find our way back to a, a, an ability to see one another as human beings. There is a lot of what is happening uh, now that is fueled by media, that is fueled by disinformation, that is absolutely fueled by demagoguery. But you also see a majority of Americans saying they, they are afraid of the polarization, they hate the polarization, they hate the, pol the entire political process. And so we have to find ways to come back together. Uh, and, and indeed, I would say the kind of convenings that Sala holds, uh, the num many of the networks uh, work like more in common, common future, uh, common agenda. There, there are many efforts that are, are being launched at the local level, uh, and New America will be working in that space regardless of what happens. I, it's not as simple as, oh, let's come back together. We have truly deep divisions, but they are fanned in a way that dehumanizes the other, and that is extremely dangerous on both sides. Yes, dehumanizing the enemy, absolutely. Um, Julian, you know, what lessons of history are ringing in your ears right now? Well, two periods come to mind, uh, in part because I'm studying them, but one is I, I study the eight, uh, 1960s a lot, and so it's hard not to kind of see echoes of the contentious moment that we were in 1968. Again, often issue driven uh, with where we are today, uh, where the intensity of the splits over uh, key questions then issues like Vietnam and uh, the civil rights movement today, all the issues we're discussing really were causing these huge fissures. Um, and part of them get worked out in elections, part don't though. Uh, so we should remember that. And a second for me is it's a little after what Eddie was talking about, it's it's the period between the 1900s and 1960s when we have the Jim Crow system uh, in, in the South. And 
Uh, we actually moved far away from a democratic system uh, in this country that included disenfranchisement, included unconstitutional electoral mechanisms. And uh, the point is, our electoral system is incredibly fragile. The fight for voting rights has been uh, an intense struggle. Uh, the intent, the fight for the democratic system has not been a clear line from bad uh, to robust. It, it's constantly being attacked, and you can see it in states like Mississippi and Alabama and others in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And so that's an important reminder when we're talking about the fragility right now. We should not take for granted uh, or assume that this is a country where the democracy is stable. Um, and so all the elections in that period where people were systematically denied the ability to vote, Black Americans, comes to mind right now, not just because of voting rights, but because of the broader anti-democratic traditions that are part of this country. The illiberal traditions are part of our past as much as the liberal mm. traditions. So interesting. You know, we we are on the Sala series along with New America talking about purpose driven le leadership. So what can leaders, perhaps not elected leaders, but people on, on this Zoom, what can they do to help reinforce, you know, the pillars of democracy that I referred to in the intro? And, and so identify those pillars for me and ways in which purpose driven leadership might be able to uh, come to aid in sense. I mean, I, I think of all of the high profile people who are out on the campaign trail, whether it's Mark Cuban or Elon Musk, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, you know, actors uh, on the stage right now. Uh, let me go out of order a little bit. Anne-Marie, let me start with you. Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I'm just going to say, I think Mark Cuban and Elon Musk both are part of the problem, regardless of the size. I mean, the amount of money that is, it, it is, it is truly sickening and it's corrupt. Uh, in other, other countries, look at what, you know, people are allowed to give up to a million dollars uh, per person you can give if you bundle it all, uh, you know, that those are elections that are bought by the rich uh, and that's not acceptable. So just just saying, uh, but the, the in terms of what can we do, there are a number of things. One is, again, you can come back together in the kinds of groups. Many of them are faith groups, even though religion has also been deeply polarized. But there are faith groups. There are things like the Rotary Group and the scouts uh, and sports teams. There are still many of these groups that you don't think of as political, and that's the point. They are the bedrock of, of a, a, a well-functioning democracy in the sense that they, they are what political scientists have called cross-cutting cleavages. They, they allow me to see Eddie not just as a, somebody or Julian as somebody who votes a certain way, but is somebody who I see in the round. So engaging that way is very important. And it can be, again, often on local issues. They could be environmental issues. They could be, you know, let's improve our town. They could be participatory budgeting. But the other thing that I think people can do is to actually join the movement for political reform. Because I very much agree with Julian that we have we have an entire history of, of suppressing franchise. We've we've expanded it and then suppressed it uh, in, in many very undemocratic ways. But the other problem is our political system is an 18th century political system that simply cannot handle the diversity of the country that we are becoming. We no longer have an ability to have any to have any sort of more moderate center. We we used to have four parties. We used to have liberal Republicans and conservative Republicans and conservative Democrats and liberal Democrats. And the liberal the conservative uh, Democrats and the liberal Republicans could actually come together, even in the sixties and seventies, as turbulent as those times were. We need to overhaul our electoral system. We need we need to get as close to to proportional voting as we can. That could be fusion voting. That can be ranked choice voting. This does not require a constitutional amendment. I'm talking about the electoral college, uh, I'm talking about what states can do. In New Jersey, there was a moderate party formed uh, to, of non-Trump Republicans that was deemed illegal under the state constitution. That's a part of the state constitution that was passed 100 years ago and is being challenged now. The same is true in Kansas with Unite the Unite Kansas Party. 
There are many Americans who want better representation across race, gender, ethnicity, every kind of division. And our political system is calcified in ways that make that very hard. So all Americans can actually fight for a more representative democracy simply by signing up for electoral reform. So you don't have to be a billionaire to be a purpose-driven leader. Um, Julian, let me go with you. Well, in terms of the top down, it's for me very clear, and it's hard because we need to find the right people. We need leaders who abide by norms. Uh, and I mean, I do think Vice President Harris has modeled that. It's just a normal campaign about issues and ideas. She's not invoking violence. Uh, but we do need some uh, kind of generational change where the guardrails are put back into place. And I think this is very important. It's not just about them, but they are modeling for people at local politics and state politics and in student government. Uh, how do you have differences and how do you kind of hash out and struggle over profound splits, but do it in ways that don't erode the democratic process and don't generate uh, behavior, which is frankly dangerous. So norm establishing leadership is really important in my mind, given where we have landed. I think citizenship engagement, whatever you want to call it, uh, which happens at many levels, I know all of us are in different ways trying to work on that, is really urgent. I mean, for the young people who are coming of age in this contentious period, who have come of age with COVID, uh, who come of age in an era where uh, distrust is so high. I mean, it's been high for decades now, uh, but every kind of effort that we have to get students and young people to learn about politics, to take politics seriously, you can do it through TikTok, you can do it through the classroom, I don't really care, uh, and ultimately make sure that kind of voting and political life is a regular part and as exciting as anything else they do is really uh, a central and paramount objective. And finally, it's it's kind of, uh, it's, it's a lower level task, but conversation generating institutions and organizations, whether it's New America, SAL, anything, uh, universities, I think matters in the end. Getting people to talk in a fragmented age is really hard. Uh, but I think all of us who teach see the benefits of that. When a classroom really works, you could have people who are far in different places, but the conversation itself is part of what democracy is. And you can't just tell people to do it. You have to create spaces to do it. And I think people are interested. You have to do it the right way. Uh, but for me, that's a task that should be top of the list, not bottom of the list in the next few years. It's really hard to follow all of that because I think it's it's absolutely right. I think we have to, I think we have to tell the truth about our past. Uh, we have to tell a more robust story that can release us into a different way of imagining ourselves together. I think oftentimes uh, the idea of 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 generating a sense of, I don't want to say consensus, but a new way of being together often is predicated upon leaving troublesome notions behind, troublesome experiences behind. We don't need to resolve them. We just kind of move on. And what happens, of course, is that uh, the tumor is still there and it continues to grow and we find ourselves right, in, right back in the problem. I mean, it's kind of like the eternal return of American politics uh, that has everything to do with the compromises uh, that we're grappling with. Ed Chairman Marinsky, uh, the, 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 the dean of, of Berkeley Law School, uh, has written an interesting book about the fact that we're living under a constitutional regime that was actually based on an agrarian slaveholding society that can't deal with the complexity of our current moment. So I think Anne Marie, you're absolutely right. We're going to have to deal with electoral reform. We're going to have to imagine ourselves differently in light of who we actually are, and that requires some storytelling, uh, some honest uh, and 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 honest storytelling. But it also requires of, of us, I think, addressing some of the hard on the ground issues that get in the way that gum up democratic processes. We got to deal with gerrymandering, right? We got to deal with the way in which the process has, in some ways, uh, 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 deepened polarization as folk who pursue power have tried to rig the terms of the game. We have to deal with algorithms that intensify our hatreds, 
um, intensify our hatreds and in some ways distort and disfigure the deliberative process. So if citizens aren't acquiring the relevant information to engage in, in uh, informed decision-making, then democracy itself is in jeopardy. So what we have to do is think about the nature of the public domain where we're engaged in deliberation, where we can engage in reasoned choice, make reasonable choices, as opposed to having our passions move us about, especially passions that are rooted in ugly, ugly historical questions, right? Uh, passions that are exploited by politicians for their own ends, aims and ends. So I agree with everything uh, that Julian and, and Anne-Marie have, have said, but I also want to insist, though, that we tell the truth about ourselves as a nation. Mm -hmm. We don't need to look to Europe, Juju, for fascism. Europe was looking to us, and That's we need true. to understand why. And once we understand why, then maybe we can tap the root and free ourselves into imagining a new America, it seems to me. That's the next question that popped up on our audience questions. So feel free to uh, to add. I want to follow up, Julian, with this idea of guardrails being off. What are those guardrails that are gone? And, and what does that mean to a good democracy? But the other question to, to layer on top of that, which is, again, a totally different question, but it came from our audience and it's a good one. You, you mentioned the polarization, Eddie. Half the country is frustrated enough to risk the democracy, risk the status quo. What is the root cause of that feeling of disenfranchisement? Is it economic? Is it social? Is it racial? And how can those issues be addressed? So um, again, I'm going to go out of order and Julian, start with you. I mean, with, I want to add, I'm sorry, I'm going to just add one thing because Eddie said something important. There's something yes. very specific going on. I mean, there is kind of a legislative assault on education that's taking place in parts of the country to legislate what you can teach, to legislate what you can read, to legislate what libraries can have. And it's just, there's one thing that should just not be happening. And there needs to be pushback because what Eddie is talking about, what Anne Marie is talking about, what I'm talking about, all depends on kind of an actual opening of the mind and an open mind. And you can't do that if you're trying to enforce some manufactured history and manufactured narrative about the country, which just isn't true and doesn't actually facilitate the development of citizen, citizenship skills. In terms of norms, look, I'm all for partisanship. I actually have a book coming out about it. I think it reflects the uh, changes, but hyper-partisanship is different. And uh, you can really have profound disagreements, but you can use rhetoric that does not demonize, vilify uh, your uh, opponent. And I think we're seeing a lot of that. You can have norms where a lot of presidential power can, back to the highest level, can be deployed. It's very hard to check it. We have tried in the 70s. We tried to restrain presidential power, but presidents can find ways around it. So some of it, this is a lesson of the Trump years, depends on the internal norms and boundaries of the person in power. Uh, and so we need guardrails on how we deploy political power. There has to be a balance between winning and exercising power and two other big parts of politics, which is governing and making sure we can still govern and handle the big issues and protecting democratic institutions. And we need people who balance the three and uh, we need people who are willing to limit their own kind of ambitions and what what they are capable or where they are willing to go in these partisan fights. Eddie, pick up from there. Yeah, you know, I was just sitting here thinking, you know, we've only been a multiracial democracy since 1965. Yeah. And then 15 years later, Reagan is elected to undo it. Just think about the, you know, the root, you know, the the debate around reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act in 1980 and 1881. Reagan only concedes when he says, well, okay, we'll do it, but we need to get rid of section 5, section 4, section 5. And Roberts was there. Chief Justice Roberts was there. And he ends up doing it, right, with Shelby, right? So we think about the Immigration Act, that other piece of major legislation alongside the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Immigration Act of 1965, which changed the quotas, changed, to, in some ways, the demographic flow of the country. What are we uh, dealing with? The reason with? why I'm sitting here with you right now is exactly. that I immigrated, of, my family immigrated on the 1965 Immigration Act. 
And Juju, part of what we're dealing with right now is a kind of panic and terror around the browning of America. The idea that some people, those folk who exist in rural America, who are not in metropolitan spaces, and let's be clear, rural America is just as, is, is really the black and brown folk in rural America too. But the idea that there, this notion of America is being lost as big government has put placed its thumb on the scale to give undeserving people stuff from deserving white folks, right? And so part of what we're dealing with is this idea, this nostalgic longing for an America that's driving in so many ways the ugliness of our current moment. And I think once we understand that more clearly, perhaps we can orient ourselves to how we might respond uh, more effectively. Emery. Can I jump in on that? Um, so, yes, I mean, you know, we new America is a, that new America. That's what we're talking about. Americans under uh, by by 2027, Americans under 30, there'll be no white majority, no European American majority. White is white includes North Africans on our census. It's not a relevant category for for what we're talking about here. We're talking about uh, European Americans who've been 75 to 80 percent of our population for 200 years. And now we are coming, we are already there with Americans under 30. There is no one majority group. There is there are European Americans, roughly 50%, uh, Hispanic Americans, somewhere between 25 and 30%, African Americans between 10 and 13%. And that is changing so fast. It, from my point of view, quite wonderfully, we're gonna be a, a country for the next 250 years that reflects the whole world. Uh, in, in many different changing uh, uh, sort of groups and, of course, interracial groups as well. But that is a huge amount of change. When you look at Europe, you are seeing populist right-wing country uh, movements based on 10% of population change. And we've had to do, as you said, since 1965, we've just had dramatic change. Now, you know, for many of us, that is exciting, and that is what makes America America, and uh, we ha we should embrace that. It is also true that we cannot see a collective future for ourselves that multiracial, multi-ethnic, representative democracy without facing our past. Very honestly, just what Eddie said. I wrote a book called Renewal that said you cannot move forward. Yeah. whether personally or nationally, unless you face where you've been. Um, any therapist will tell you that. It's true more, more generally. But then you have to have a framework that says, yes, we need reckoning, but we also need pride, right? We're not going to get there if it's only negative. We've got to be able to say there are many things we can be proud of, and there are many, of, many things that we should be ashamed of and that we have to reckon with. And then together, and I'm borrowing Ted Johnson's framework, uh, uh, senior advisor at New America, pride, reckoning, and then aspiration. Who do we want to be? And how can we be that nation that we want to be and get there together? And, and Juju, just really quickly, there's a footnote to what, what Anne-Marie said. I mean, when we think about the current, I mean, because I think that framework is absolutely right. But when we think about the current debates around immigration, how they're how they're bound up with all of the anxieties and ugliness of this, I mean, ex, you know, great for replacement theory. We just heard it at Madison Square Garden. It's driven by these anxieties. And they're trying to take us back to an immigration regime of 1924. Yeah. Which is deeply rooted in the period that Julian was just telling us, talking about. And if we don't understand that and, and understand the fuel of it, you know, I mean, we place ourselves in really deep danger, it seems to me. Let's look at the information flow, though, right? Because, Eddie, I would just, you know, the idea that I think it's like 65% of uh, uh, in a poll said that they're in favor of mass deportations. Um, and that was a percentage that has shot up dramatically in the last, you know, cycle, given the amount of rhetoric that's out there right now. Um, so my question is about flow of information. Um, you know, this idea that we're talking about in this cycle of low information voters, um, which is uh, also separate but similar to low propensity voters. I think I, I shared with you, I'm heading to Michigan, uh, and I just spent some time on the phone yesterday with the Republican Party chair in Michigan. 
And they're targeting low propensity voters. They're targeting uh, young men. Uh, they're seeing a lot of growth in that uh, sector. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, and yet young Harris Walls voters are on TikTok, you know, cutting up and re recirculating the extra surveillance tape that the Gen Z have never heard before. Um, and, and sort of, again, flow of information, then add to that misinformation, disinformation, um, which is separate and apart from rhetoric um, that's being spewed on the campaign trail. Um, I, I'm just say, citing data points and trying to wrap it into a question for you all about how do we get information to low information voters? How do we get information if that's the key to a strong democracy is, a, is an informed and engaged electorate? Mm. Uh, Eddie, Julian. you're up now. <laughs> oh, I thought it was to Julian. Oh, no, Julian. Okay. Julian, you're up. Okay. I thought sure. You I mean, I, it's a big problem. The only thing I'd add, it's not just low information voters. It's people with lots of information. They have the wrong information. Very smart people who follow the news. You'll hear them say things, and, and you're kind of like, what? What are you talking about? That's Things that are just knowably not true become part of the conversation very quickly. And we have a convergence, in my mind, of kind of two things have happened at once. One is a filterless media, which I think it's different than a partisan media. And I think a lot of this does come from social media and the internet where there are no guardians to the gate. And it's very easy to get information out. It could be false information, skewed information, and very quickly, uh, nationally, internationally, and to the point where trying to rebut it, fact checking it, it's useless because it's out there in our ecosystem. And you saw that with the Springfield, Ohio story. It's it's very, very difficult. I don't have an answer, um, but I do think that's a big source and something different in the last decade than we had even in the 1990s, early 2000s, combined with demagoguery, where uh, that's back to the guardrails, where you have politicians who are willing to fuel these kinds of stories uh, again and again, whether it's about immigrants, whether it's about race, whether it's about vaccines, take your pick. Uh, but they're willing to tap into that. Not all of them, but some are willing to tap into that. And you put those two together and that's where we are. And certainly if you're a low information voter, it's very easy to basically shape uh, how you're going to think of certain problems. And uh, I just think the rest of us, and, and I'm sure I've had this problem, although if we follow politics probably closer than most people, it, it gets into the flow and it's very damaging. Uh, I think with immigration, what uh, Eddie was saying is it's become very pronounced. I mean, we have now uh, uh, not, A, we've shifted from a debate on immigration uh, that combined discussions of a, a kind of liberal path to citizenship, and rationalizing the process combined with border uh, control to just border control, just deportation. And then added to that, we're not having a conversation based on a debate about how do you have a secure border. We've now just thrown in all kinds of very blistering and divisive and, and really horrible kind of accusatory stories about what undocumented people are doing. And in this media world, it's very easy to get those out quickly. Uh, and then we have a just destructive conversation. So we need leaders who are not going to demagogue this stuff. And I do think uh, it's not a government issue always. I do think uh, the kind of people in the media, and I don't just mean reporters or opinion people, I mean the, the people who run the newsrooms, the people who are uh, executives have to think of how can we construct and rebuild a strong public commons so we can have the debates in a safe and constructive way. I, I don't need to tell you about the Washington Post uh, editorial right. or the LA Times editorial that didn't happen um, this cycle. Um, and I do think that these conversations across differences are, uh, you know, just not happening, that it's just they've turned into shouting matches. Yeah, I but it's, it's you. And and when you think about how uh, information gathering has segmented along lines, have been siloed, uh, where folks who are only going to spaces to acquire their information that confirm uh, their current beliefs, so they're not really engaged in a kind of um, 
uh, cross section of, of comparison of information data, right? You think about um, uh, the crossfire nature of our deliberation, right? You have one side holding a view and another side holding a view, and we think that's the way in which we ought to get information. Uh, you have uh, a kind of business model driving the dissemination of information. So what happens when we, and 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 Juju, you know this as well as I do, as well as everyone on the panel knows it, we, we enter into these election cycles and we immediately go into the horse race. And instead of thinking about the particulars, we're just kind of charting who's in a, who's ahead, who's going to win. And then on top of that, we know a generation of folks, they're not watching uh, news in the traditional mainstream media. They're literally finding their, uh, they're getting their information from these very surface, short, quick clicks. Um, and so what does it mean for democracy when the fourth estate has fragmented in such a way? And citizens are acquiring information in the way that they should in order to deliberate about matters. The question of self-governance is then on the table. Can we govern ourselves if we're not informed in the ways that we should be? Uh, how do we address it? Well, we're going to have to address the profit motive in, 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 in media. We're going to have to address the algorithm that's driving particular information to particular po uh, 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 publics. Uh, so... It's a multifaceted problem that will require multifaceted response. So Anne-Marie, before you jump in, I'm just gonna toss out three questions that came in from the audience, just cause it's relevant to this conversation, but you know, we're gonna run out of time before we go, go around. One is, you know, I think it was Julian who brought up gerrymandering. Um, how is that, how much does that have to do with the collapse of the center is this brilliant question. Um, the other is about um, th what I just mentioned, the Washington Post and the LA Times refraining from endorsing. What is the ramifications of that? What are the ramifications of that? And finally, the best question of all perhaps is what do the future of both parties look like? Is there MAGA after Trump? Um, where should the Democratic Party trend further left or center? Um, and is there the, the pipe dream of a third party? Where does that go? I just added that. Um, Anne-Marie, uh, take it whichever way you will. Frozen. I think she just froze. Um, uh, Julian, why don't you pick up and we'll, we'll wait for her to come back. Sure, I'll, I'll leave. Uh, Eddie actually raised gerrymandering, so I'll, I'll leave that uh, for, for him. The, the media, the Washington Post story is an example where it's the kind of profit element of, of the media and intimidation from politics, which is terrible. I mean, look, if, if the Washington Post decided on their own, just clean cut, I, we don't want to endorse people, I think it would be very controversial. And I think many people would disagree if that decision is being made for fear of how that might affect not only the newspaper, but a whole other business, uh, i.e. Amazon, uh, then we're in a realm that's uh, quite troubling. And it gets back to, again, where we started on democratic threats. That's a democratic threat. It's not just a press issue because you have people scared of just putting out news, putting out opinion. Uh, and and we can't have that. So I think some of the kind of root causes that Eddie talked about uh, with the media are front and center and with the Republican Party. I, I think we should just be clear of where the Republican Party is. It's time to stop the speculation of what happens after Trump. Trump is one incarnation of where the party has fully moved. Uh, the only anomalies out there at this point are the anti-Trump Republicans. They're anomalies within their own party, make no mistake about it. And most of them will still support the MAGA, Trump, whatever you want to call it, ideology. I, I'm a believer Trump is a product of the new era of Republican politics, not the cause. So it won't go away. It'll be different. It might not include his particular style. But this is the GOP, at least in the next few election cycles, uh, in terms of ideas, in terms of governing style, and in terms of coalition that will be on the table uh, for some time to come. Emery. Let me jump in while I have a, an internet. I suppose if I were a conspiracy theorist, I could think that this is just disinformation. Somebody is trying to block <laughs> me, but I'm afraid it's just uh, not strong enough. But but let me say a couple things about uh, the 
first the point of just about disinformation to link it to something that Julian said about a good education, right? Part of what we need to be doing is educating all Americans, but particularly young people, that they are dupes if they are not asking questions and being skeptical about what they are being told. Now, that is the basis of critical thinking. That is what a good education should do. In this context, we really have to alert uh, all, you know, all of our kids that we live in an, an information environment in which it, it, there is a radical difference. Uh, there are no gatekeepers. Julian, you said filterless, and I think that's right. But it is also possible to find good information if you are taught how to do that, if you are taught how to question, and that you should never take anything. On, on one side. You know, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, a former law professor. That's what we teach you to do. You know, what are the arguments on this side? What are the arguments on that side? And you make up your mind because you are empowered as a citizen uh, of a, a democracy. And then just a word on gerrymandering, and we'll go back to uh, to Eddie. I, I definitely think that, that gerrymandering is part of the problem, but you will notice that even states uh, like Ohio, where they, they have... Uh, um, actually elected a sort of a neutral commission, uh, the results of that commission uh, were rejected. So it, it runs into polarization and it runs into residential segregation because the other thing that has happened is Americans have moved apart into, some of that is, is redlining and, and clustering uh, African-Americans and poor Americans into specific areas. But a lot of it is we don't, we live in enclaves with people like us. So even when you, when you have sort of neutral gerrymandering, uh, it doesn't solve the problem. Again, what would solve the problem is moving to something we had in the 19th century, which are multi-member districts, right? There's no reason you have to divide up a state into eight, 10, 15 districts. Some small states only, only have, have one or two. You can have a few districts or one district and have multiple candidates on is a that, list. Is and that, that way, fusion voting? You mentioned fusion voting, and I was like, I don't know what that is. Okay, so that's not fusion voting. That's multi-member districts. Fusion voting is something that we had across the country in the 19th century. And in fact, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln was elect was nominated and then elected on fusion voting. It just means, as New, as New York has, you can have a third party or a fourth party, but you fuse your vote with one of the existing parties. Rather than what we have right now, if you have a third party in most states, you have to run a third candidate, and that's a spoiler. That's immediately then handing the election to someone else. So if you imagine if Jill Stein, or if it had been Ross Perot, or any other of the third candidates we've had, were in a, in a fusion voting system, instead of saying, okay, we're going to run a third party and we're going to then have a third candidate, you just say, and this is what the moderate party in New Jersey wanted to do, they were Republicans, they were anti-Trump Republicans, and they wanted to endorse the Democratic candidate. Same thing now in Kansas, where you, you bring together a united Kansas party and they then say, we're going to endorse the Republican or the Democrat. Gives them a lot of power because they're bringing votes. They can say, you know, this is the candidate we want. Uh, and does allows you to have more parties without automatically in a first-past-the-post system uh, creating a spoiler. And so we've had this system. It works. It still works in New York. Uh, most of the states made it unconstitutional at the end of the 19th century because it disrupted the monopoly of the two big parties. We're ve we're very unusual uh, among our peers in in, in other, our fellow countries where we have uh, only two parties and you can win without winning a majority of the population. Interesting, um, Eddie, you're muted, but I want we have five minutes left. I want you to say your piece and then we'll close out with the other two uh, as a final statement. Well, you know, my 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 piece is very straightforward. Um, uh, we can't outsource our responsibility for democracy in this moment. Uh, we have to take responsibility for it. All hangs on it. I'm nervous. I'm anxious. And I'll say why, to be honest with you. Um, everything hangs on what white women will do. That's true. This entire election. 
I mean, we're going to have to see if Dobbs matters in that way. And historically, um, for me, the answer to that question has been uh, uh, at best, you know, well, how will white women vote in relation to these major questions? Um, it makes my gut turn upside down in some ways. So I'm deeply anxious, but I understand that we're at the crossroads. It's a blues moment. Let's see what happens. I had to say that. You're right. Julian? Uh, I just, you know, again, uh, it's where we started. I fear that we are not in a place uh, where our democratic system is stable. And I think all the threats are real. All the vulnerabilities have been exposed. And uh, all the underlying weaknesses that we have had since the founding are front and center. And I really think it is incumbent on all of us, uh, not only to vote and to uh, get other people to vote, but to think about how each of us can help to strengthen the democracy in the coming decade. This isn't a one month project uh, so that a generation from now, they worry about who to vote for, but they don't really worry about whether they'll be able to vote or how will that vote be tabulated. We can't be in this place anymore. And I just say that uh, one of the things that you hear a lot of whatever Trump says doesn't matter because last time the system held. Well, last time, if we're talking, uh, you know, 2016 and then 2020, um, the system held, but barely. Uh, and this time um, we are facing a crisis of our democracy, but we are also possibly facing a real opportunity uh, to bring, to come together and recognize the depth of the crisis and work in so many ways, again, at the local level, the national level, uh, to, to create the democracy we both want and need uh, to flourish in a very different country and a very different time. I'm so grateful uh, for all three of you, uh, your three big brains and your incredibly loud voices um, that you've added to this uh, conversation. Thank you so much. And of course, thanks to Peter Farnsworth and Jimmy Kraft for um, bringing the Sally series into our lives and to New America for the work that you do and, and for your role in this particular conversation. Um, all right, everyone go out there and vote and we'll see you on the next time.